Okay, uh, hello everyone, and welcome to this awesome stream. Uh, once again, I'm back with uh, another Cloud Native stream, this time on a very interesting topic, which is Cozy. And uh, I mean, a lot of people might not know what Cozy is and uh, uh, what uh, things are cooking with, uh, you know, uh, the Kubernetes uh, native operating system in that space, what is going around. So uh, Cozy is basically a common operating system interface, a very API-driven kind of interface that uh, Andrew and uh, Steven will be talking about today. So Andrew has been here before uh, the stream. Uh, he has uh, he demoed uh, and streamed about uh, Talos, and Andre was also there. But today, unfortunately, Andre uh, had some another meeting, so he wasn't able to join. But we have Steven with us, uh, who has been involved in this project, and will talk a lot about the motivation, what what brings us today, uh, why Cozy exists, and why why do, why we are working towards uh, this this uh, particular approach. So uh, once again, welcome Andrew to the stream, and uh, hope you enjoyed the previous one, and we'll make this one more fun. And welcome Steven uh, to the stream as well. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, Steven, you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Steven Barelli. I'm a, a solutions engineer for Upbound. Um, so if you know them, they're a, they write Kubernetes controllers for writing for managing infrastructure, kind of a next generation infrastructure platform. So um, been doing system administration for a very long time in my career. I've worked for a lot of big companies, so it's kind of fun right now to be part of a smaller company and like working on software all the time. Cool. And uh, I'm Andrew Reinhardt. I am the CTO of Talos Systems um, and having fun building a Linux distribution completely from scratch and doing things like Cozy. Cool. I'll just remove this banner. Yeah. So if you are new to the channel, uh, please uh, take care. And, uh, so please uh, care to subscribe uh, to it so that you do not miss any of the future streams. Uh, so I'm, I'm planning a lot of streams uh, after, you know, after I finish off my work. So I try to learn everything new. And uh, in this way, I mean, you can also learn with me. So we all learn together. So that's why it's let's learn together. And uh, so today we'll be talking uh, about Cozy project and a lot of things around it. And Andrew do have a demo for us as well. Uh, so it might not be extremely something that you can do from scratch, but Andrew will try to, uh, you know, uh, Try to make it um, understandable so that uh, you, uh, if you want to contribute, which I think you will, uh, because you will be having that sort of motivation where you understand what is behind it and what's the scope of this, so so that you can, you know, uh, then contribute back and, and attend the meetings, attend the weekly uh, calls that that Cozy project has, and um, uh, there are a lot of amazing folks behind the project and behind this uh, this idea uh, to make it a reality and. Uh, yeah, so let's let's get started. Uh, so, what what is Cozy uh, all about, and you know um, why it first came into existence? What what were, what were the problems that were there, and you are trying to solve uh, right now after we complete uh, more than seven years of, of Kubernetes? Yeah, I mean, I think before we could really answer that well, uh, I think Stephen does a phenomenal job of explaining. Stephen, maybe you want to touch on the Unix history a little bit and how. You know uh, where we are, and con uh, contrast that with what we're trying to do with with Cozy. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a good starting point too, because um, I've been using Unix for a long time. You know, um, probably since my college days, and you know, and that was during the Sun Microsystems era back then. Um, you know, I had a, a next station in college, so you know, one of the early Unix systems there. So that's how I got into Unix. Um, and if you use Unix today, it's very much the same kind of model, like, you know, and that's one of the great things about Unix. It's a platform that really hasn't changed in the last 40 or 50 years, you know, like um, it has a lot of great primitives that we've been able to build, you know, everything from the smallest systems to the biggest systems, right? Like from the giant compute clusters that we have today that, you know, power websites to like small Raspberry Pi devices that, you know, barely take any CPU. So the model has been incredible, but um you know, I've spent a lot of my career in Unix managing Unix systems, and that's where a lot of the problems come up. Uh, you know, I was, um, I've been working in the Kubernetes space for a while, and then as part of a project, I had to go back and actually manage operating system images using some more traditional tools like Chef and Ansible. And what I found out was that the kind of things I took for granted, you know, like item potency and um, having a really nice API for configuring things are, are not really there present in Unix systems, right? They still have a very kind of, old school where like every, there's not a consistent API, um, there, things aren't agreed upon. So there's just like a lot of core issues that we struggle with. And also, you know, 
a lot of Unix history is like it, Unix history, when you started it, um, they connected via serial terminals. Like if you go all the way back to the earliest days of Unix, you know, they basically attached a teletype to a system and they shared that, you know, it was for developers. Um, and even today, if you look at like a lot of Unix management, it's basically secure shell, which is embeds teletype over an encrypted channel. You know, when like you're SSHing into a system, you're, you know, you're, you're sitting upon, you know, um, I like ancient history a lot. So, you know, you know, being Italian and, you know, so going to Pompeii changed my life and everything. And just like seeing how things are built on the rubble of everything else, you know, um, you know, we're, we're managing these Kubernetes clusters on SSH. And if you go in the SSH source code, you see that they're actually allocating, you know, teleterminals, right? So you, I like you, that you, analogy. That's yeah, a great so, one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's kind of the idea. So, you know, after working on this project, I'm like, what can we do to, you know, if we were rethinking Unix from the start and having it be something that's manageable for cluster operators, because we're Kubernetes folks, right? Like what we care about, the people who wrote Unix were developers and they cared about shared terminals and doing text processing and all those other things. That's what they cared about. But our use case, and this is why um, Andrew and I connected, it's like our use case is we want to manage systems in bulk in a very easy way and we wanna make it very easy to manage them and change things on them and be secure that when we do that, it's easy to do. Um, so the use case is a little different and that's kind of where Cozy started coming apart. You know, it's like, um, you know, cause there's a lot of great things in Talos as an operating system itself. You know, some of the concepts of being API first of being really limited and uh, in what it does and its, its, and its surface of what it does is really, um, you know, kind of an evolution of operating systems and we thought, could we make that generic? And that's kind of where Cozy came from what's cur currently named Cozy. Yes, uh, <laughs> we have to change the name. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's kind of a background of it. You know, like if you could start from zero and think about a Linux system designed to be managed in clusters, what would you do? Yeah, that's that's very interesting uh, because uh, Unix has been there for a long time now, and the things are moving in a you know cloud native way, everything is moving in a cloud native way. So how we can move an operating system in a cloud native way, obviously uh, uh, people must have been thinking and now there is, there is a, a group of people who are actually working towards uh, towards that. So that that's uh, that's pretty interesting. So yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, it's, it's it may seem uh, a little radical, but I think it's necessary. Really, you have to rethink it from the ground up, from the root up. You have to rethink this because there's a lot of concepts and a lot of practices that just simply weren't around back then. And uh, we keep just throwing stuff. I mean, Stephen, I don't think I can beat your analogy. That, that's a great one. We just keep throwing stuff on top of this old way of doing things. And it just feels hacky, really, to be honest. And so, you know, it's, um, it's asking ourselves, what can we do fundamentally different? And what that kind of translates to is, okay, uh, instead of a shell, let's have an API that programs speak to each other over. Um, instead of uh, actual users hopping on and doing stuff, let's have those be controllers instead. So it's much more machine oriented and less human oriented. Let's push the humans towards working towards uh, higher up the stack in this clustered environment where they're pushing their cluster manifests or, you know, sorry, Kubernetes manifests and such. Um, but let's keep them out from underneath and let's bring the idea of controllers and like kind of how Kubernetes operates, but down to the operating system itself, really. Yeah. And, and when you talk about uh, controllers in Kubernetes, they give you, you know, a lot of flexibility. You can write uh, multiple custom controllers and uh, the operators, and then you can, you know, uh, have yep. a lot of control over your Kubernetes. And with the same approach, when you're building from grounds up, by the way, yeah, Andrew is a big fan of, you know, writing the Linux from scratch. Uh, he told me that in the in the past stream. So when you are thinking of like grounds up approach, uh, then you have much more granular control and uh, you can build things on top of that. So, right. and yes, you are right uh, that uh, we have not thought, like we are still building on top of what we had traditionally. So we had a Unix operating system. We are, we are uh, I mean, we have, great technologies out there, Kubernetes is there, so the cloud native tech is there, and we are just building on top of what we had. So why not something uh, create natively for, for the thinking, for the thoughts, for the products, for the cloud native landscape that we have, why not have natively something for that, uh, so that it can have more control, more features, more, more granular stuff out there. Exactly, sounds like you get it. 
<laughs> yeah. So yeah, now what what cozy is all about? So cozy, I mean, I think Stephen alluded to this. Really, is just how can we standardize this in the same way that we we started with Docker, and Docker really came in and changed the way that we deploy applications, and then a bunch of folks got together and they came up with the OCI spec. This is what the spec for a container looks like, and then now we have a booming tech around that idea. And it's not just proprietary to Docker. And it has really helped the industry. In the same way, you know, we have CNI and CRI and CSI and all of these interfaces that Kubernetes uses, but we have nothing for it to talk to the operating system. If you look at how the Kubelet works, it is shelling out to binaries, you know, um, it, it just there's it. You would be stunned to know how much the Kubelet actually tr op, uh, works with the. Um, like for example, there's a new, relatively new feature. Um, I'm probably going to botch the details, but the gist of it is that when you um, basically reboot a node, you use systemd or something to that effect to stop all the pods or something. Um, I'm botching it. But anyways, the point is, is that the Kubelet's trying to talk to system D itself, right? Um, in the case of Talos, we don't have system D. So it feels like there's room for an interface for things like the Kubelet to talk to the operating system instead of giving it full on permissions to do what it needs to do. Um, maybe full access to slash proc. It can have very finely scoped RBAC policies that apply to what is it trying to get underneath slash proc instead of just a blanket permissions or something like that? Um, Steven, I don't know. Am I missing anything? I think that's the the primary like case study or use case that we're evaluating right now. Yeah. And I think one thing there that I think Kubernetes really revolutionized was having like a standard API for backend primitives. So like we have things like the network interface and the storage interface, right? So you know if you define something in the front end, you don't care as much of how it's applied in the back end. Um, and what you see like in the Unix community, because like even when you look at um, like new container operating systems, like, you know, they were coming out like Flatcar Linux and Battle Rocket and K3OS, they all use different init systems. They use different configuration languages. They use different things in cloud init. So we don't have the standardization. You know, it's like the API is whatever's implemented and then you can't, you know, so like that's the big difference philosophically between kind of the way Kubernetes works and how Linux has worked historically. Um, you know, um, yeah, I saw someone made a comment there about CNI plugins. You know, they basically <laughs> go exec something on the local system, right? Like it's like a, it's kind of like the bootstrapping a CNI plugin is kind of hacky. And then even you look at things like cluster API, like when you're actually configuring a node, there's like things that cluster API does and then the Kubelet duplicates right. it, right? Like, you know, so the Kubelet has to do some things in SysDTL and then cluster API is doing it and you're configuring operating systems. So the boundaries are all over the place. Um, there's not a consistent way of doing it. Like you don't manage, like even though like I think um, Bottle Rocket and Flatcar both use System D, they don't configure it the same way, right? They don't use the same tooling. So there's no consistency. And we've seen this across the entire history of Unix that we have multiple slightly incompatible versions of the same operating system. You know, first it was for Unix and now it's for Linux. Um, and we spend a lot of time just, you know, being, you know, coding around interfaces that are incompatible with one another. Yeah, yeah. And that, that uh, I think that attributes to a lot of the, you know, like look at how these things like uh, Puppet and Chef and all these things work. Or even uh, I've seen some CSIs <laughs> that actually NS enter into PID one, try to detect which operating system you're running, try to figure out if they have apt, yum, uh, Pac-Man, whatever, and actually try to install stuff to get their plugin working. And this is just, I think in the day and age that we are in now, it's, it's, it's unacceptable. And really we have to root that out again, going back to this idea of starting over, let's think about it from the ground up. Um, and so that's what Cozy fundamentally is. It's let's, as an industry, agree on this boundary, this interface um, at these boundaries for things like these CNI plugins and kublets and those things of that nature that actually uh, mutate the host operating system. 
give them um, an interface to, to speak over so we can have some consistency, regardless of which distro you're actually running. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some heroic efforts. Like if you look at the chef source code for detecting which init system there is, uh, you know, there, <laughs> there's like, um, they've done incredible work, you know, like they basically look for if a binary is present, right? So they, so they iterate through is, you know, system D present, if not, is init D present, is upstart present. They just go through each one looking <laughs> for it. I mean, so it's not even an API saying, hey, what init system am I running on? You know, it's basically, they have to determine. And, you know, and so the, the people who have written configuration management software have done an incredible job of trying to yeah. abstract out what's underneath, but it's not something that could be really abstracted well because the whole platform is not really designed to be managed. So, I mean, they, they've put in amazing efforts to to try to get there and, you know, people are running massive clusters under chef management. So, um, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, I think one thing too, that we haven't really pointed out yet is uh, just the, sort of the, the potential that we could have with something uh, like in the same way that Kubernetes allows you to define your infrastructure in YAML and you just simply apply those, you can now have a common way of configuring your host. So imagine a, cozy plugin and we'll get into these concepts in a little bit but or, or a cozy controller rather for now um, that manages how you uh, uh, operate an interface you know does it have this address what are the routes whatever things like this um, and you simply apply a yaml that defines this declaratively and this controller goes and makes that happen now all of a sudden you know as Stephen was saying um, in cluster api there's there's a bunch of there's basically they have this notion of a bootstrap provider and a, a large reason why this idea came about was because at Telos, we don't have SSH, there's no bash. And the way that the Kube ADM um, bootstrap provider works is it actually SSHs onto the host machine, runs a bunch of commands to install whatever Kubernetes needs, runs a bunch of typical commands that you need to get it up and running, so on and so forth. But we don't have that in Talos. In Talos, it's simply a configuration file. Um, now what if that we had a, today we have a Talos bootstrap provider and a kubeadm bootstrap provider, the Talos bootstrap provider, like I said, just simply generates, um, metadata for it and pushes it into the user data. And that's how you configure and get Kubernetes running. Now, what if we made that even more generic, just all together, you know, um, here's a common spec, a way of defining how we, um, configure an operating system. And this could be used for all uh, bootstrap providers, regardless of whether you're running, you know, you can use kubeadm under the hood, it doesn't matter, but you have a controller that translates this spec that we've all agreed on into what should actually happen. In Talos, that may not be kubeadm, that could be something else. Um, so that's the, that's the, I think, big promise too on the configuration management side is that we now have a common place for things like even Puppet and Chef could even have modules for interacting with the Cozy API. And now they have a common interface regardless of which operating system is running. Yeah. And one thing I want to say about too, um, the Cozy is kind of a limited project. Like it doesn't intend to be a general purpose operating system. Like our focus is on an operating system that could boot, through, that could run isolated workflows, workloads like containers yeah. or micro VMs or something like that. Because if you look at going back to the history of Unix, it was a shared multi-user system, right? So like a bunch of people would log in because computing resources were expensive. They'd connect with their serial terminals and they would share a file system and tools and everything else. Like even today, like we have lots of different ways of installing packages and you have this one giant file system and the package manager is trying to maintain state. And it, you yeah. get a lot of complexity just in that interface. Um, and plus the permissions boundaries are all over the place. They've kind of grown over time. So you have file system permissions, but then you have this SSH thing that has its own set of permissions that are completely separate. So it's a different model and it's not something that we could tackle right now. I don't think with what we're looking at. So our focus is much smaller. Like what is the right solution for these kind of workloads? Um, because we don't want people logging into our systems, right? We, we, you know, and we don't need a big shared file system. You know, we're looking at workloads where we want as much isolation as possible. We don't want one pod talking to another one or another workload unless we specifically allow it. Um, yeah. So that's a big difference. You know, we don't need to share a file system. We want isolation and control. 
yep uh, totally uh, totally agree to all the all the points discussed uh, now the thing is a uh, cozy project like um, uh, steven and and you have mentioned it's it's pretty new and it's it it's not for a purpose to solve everything out there and uh, you know uh, like uh, uh, it's basically focusing on some of the focus key areas uh, you want to run your isolated workloads you want to run your containers so focusing on that it's it's uh, building basically building from that and uh, on top of that obviously as the adoption increases as the number of use cases come like we were talking previously as well with andrew like what would be the road map so sometimes we cannot define the road map for a year sometimes it is like a, a genuine use case uh, that comes up and which can be easily integrated uh, with with a particular project and people start working towards that because that feature um, you know uh, will uh, will provide massive adoption and will solve a very big use case so that the roadmap also is heavily influenced by the adaptability and how how we tend to use this and how this project grows so that's that's there with most of the you know uh, open source uh, projects uh, the community driven ones especially um, where people uh, tend to first analyze how it is like we just have analyzed the history of uh, what it was and why there is a need uh, now to create you know a standardization thing and then we, uh, we we have started that journey and now on the journey as and when people joins they will be giving their own opinions how this should be integrated okay this piece also we need over there this piece is can be modified in this particular way so all these things will keep on changing with that particular ecosystem so i think that that's uh, pretty uh, pretty cool i just quickly want to uh, show so this is basically the cozy uh, repository the cozy community one actually so since the project is pretty new uh, so what is the best way andrew or uh, steven you you both uh, any of you or both of you can give your opinions what is the best way that you know the people can navigate uh, through the, the the project and uh, you know the just go yeah. out um I'd say definitely this community page has it, it's your jumping off point, right? It's uh, it's got a link to all of our calls, uh, recorded calls, uh, the HackMD that we use to communicate and and have the agenda, uh, a link, I believe, or maybe it's not here. Um, we got to figure out. We we basically have a weekly meeting, um, and you can communicate with us. Ask. We don't post it publicly just because um, people may find the link and join who, who may want to crash it but um communicate with us if you want to uh i believe there's a discussions forum that's enabled on here just tell us that you want to be part of it um and we can add you to the calendar event there's also a bunch of code um we have something called the runtime something called the engine both of which i'm going to show off in a demo um the runtime itself is actually being used in talos today so we are implementing a lot of these and proving out a lot of these ideas within Talos itself. Um, the runtime is pulled in as a library in Talos and we're building plugins and such. And we'll be pulling out code from Talos and pulling them into this uh, org and creating plugins for things like the networking stack or bootstrapping Kubernetes and stuff like this. And so you have a little more granular projects that you can actually come and pick up and, and contribute to. Uh, the core of it is called the engine. It's a Rust project. It's uh, it's 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 ambitious. Um, it does have some um, hopes of being a replacement for System D for a system such as this, but it can also be ran in a container. And its primary job really is to manage the runtime and the plugins, um, and making sure that they're running and communicating to each other properly. Um, all of this really has a long way to go. So if you're a, you know, a developer and you, this all sounds interesting to you, I'd say dig into the code and, you know, I am, my uh, first language is not Rust, it's Go. So I'm sure somebody can come along and point out some things, big mistakes that I've made. So if they have ideas, by all means, come in and contribute and just discuss with us. Um, even just coming to the meetings and telling us your use case is a way of contributing, right? Um, that gives us a lot of feedback, you know, and places in which we can have discussion and it could influence the direction of the project. So you could really contribute in a number of ways, just be part of the community, get involved, and we could find a, a way for people to contribute. Yeah, uh, so uh, like people must be wondering, like usually I do the community 
stuff at the end but uh, this is not the end <laughs> this is not the end for the stream uh, why i wanted to bring this is because this project is very new and um, uh, obviously the great minds are behind it you can see uh, chris nova is uh, is a contributor to this particular project and she is also one of the driving forces uh, so i mean you can see like uh, you know the great people in the community uh, who have uh, who have done a lot of awesome work in the communities and the cncf um, uh, landscape itself and multiple projects uh, so so uh, i think th that's uh, pretty exciting so if you see the cozy project uh, just like andrew mentioned you have the community that gives you enough of the information about uh, getting involved uh, the the meeting notes that have happened over the past uh, uh, months and also uh, how you can uh, be a part of the meetings and uh, give your opinions and, or just hear out what is actually ha actually happening uh, that is also completely okay and then uh, there is a runtime i didn't know that the runtime is is already used in in, in talos and and uh, uh, i just saw when i went to the runtime we have the uh, uh, contributor uh, andre who was uh, previously there on uh, on talos so uh, i think he's uh, driving most of the thing for uh, this particular project for the engine one and uh, yeah it's pretty interesting uh, that you know uh, there are there's a specification that is getting made out and then there's an engine which is powered by rust which is again uh, you must have seen there was a rust foundation day for, by you know uh, the cncf the first one which happened at uh, the previous kubecon uh, mm -hmm. last month and uh, so th that shows like how how the rust itself is going to uh, uh, the next level game so i think that's pretty pretty good if so if, even if you're learning rust uh, so i think that that can be one of your projects that that you know you want to play around or contribute some sort of stuff or, or, or take a small piece and and see how it works and how you can uh, how you can do that so i think that's that's pretty cool so there are some of the things that uh, you can uh, you know have a look around in the cozy project obviously uh, andrew promised that he has a cool demo to show off so uh, i'll i'll not uh, uh, take all of the things from this particular repository and let him talk to uh, all of that but i just wanted to bring that point because it's very important um, uh, from the navigation perspective like where you go where you actually go and where you actually try to uh, contribute which pieces uh, you contribute which pieces to what uh, so like like uh, Andrew mentioned uh, the, the engine piece uh, when we talk about the roadmap we can uh, talk more about that so the engine piece is having uh, uh, the roadmap already some some sort of high level kind of roadmap uh, that that you, you can see uh, it has a long way to go and uh, uh, we need more folks over there so uh, yeah anything Stephen you, you you would like to add over there no keep going <laughs> so uh, yeah i mean next is like where we are at present uh, with with cozy i mean what all things uh, uh, we have done till now with with cozy where where we are yeah i think maybe i could show a demo and i think it's best explained that way um awesome. and we can dig yeah, into cool. to the to the tech okay i could probably answer one of the questions about bpf as well Yep. Uh, is it using eBPF concept or something else? Uh, it is absolutely. Um, let's see if I can figure out share. Can you guys see this? Yep, we can see the inception and now the terminal. Great. Is that big enough? A little bit big would be better. Yep. How's that? Yep. Okay. Nice. Um, so what all I've done really is I've checked out the engine project and I've ran the command make run, um, cozy, sorry, the engine is capable of running in a, uh, container. And this is all just the standard output of it. The, the basic idea, like I said, is that the engine is responsible for basically doing process management to begin with. It's going to run the idea of plugins, the idea of a plugin really is um, almost like a Kubernetes. Well, it is a lot like a Kubernetes controller manager. We just call them plugins. You can have multiple controllers that are implemented that actually modify and manipulate and, and maintain the state of very particular and specific things within the system, such as, like I said, the routing table, network interfaces, uh, a file. It could be arbitrary, um, but a plugin could be something that for example, represents the entire networking stack and it can have controllers within it that 
manage individual pieces of the networking stack. Um, in this example, I basically have two plugins. Um, they need to be actually implemented to do something. They're just here now for demo purposes, but this idea of a mount plugin and a resolver plugin. As we build this out, the mount plugin is gonna be capable of taking in something like this. Uh, it's very much looks like Kubernetes. It's not Kubernetes. We're basically defining a mount point, but with YAML. So you can imagine this as an entry in FSTAB and a multi-doc YAML with multiple entries representing Etsy FSTAB instead of, um, instead of it being that. It's just a YAML file that represents that. And this mount plugin would handle the uh, enforcement when you actually apply this. So if I do something like um, this, you could see that the mount plugin, anything that's prefixed with something like this, it's the standard out of a plugin. You could see that the mount plugin has acknowledged that it got this request and it's going to create a mount point for us. Like I said, it needs to be implemented still. But the idea here is that this is how you would have do a lot of things within a cozy system, a mount point, network interface, so on and so forth. And these are the places where people can come in and contribute different types of plugins to help us grow this idea out even more. One of the bigger ideas, well, I wouldn't say bigger, but I think it's really cool, is this idea of a generator. And I'll show off what that means if I could find a USB stick. So today, let's imagine that you want to listen for the mounting of a USB stick. You typically set up a UDEV-D rule and do a bunch of magic to make sure that it gets mounted up and so on and so forth. And anyone who has, has, has had experience doing that, you're doing a lot of Googling, trying to figure out uh, exactly how to set up your UDEV-D rule, the order in which it gets applied, so on and so forth. In the cozy world, we have this idea of a generator and it just so happens that this uh, disk generator is an eBPF program, which is hooking into the different places in which the kernel actually adds and deletes. You can actually see it here. We're attaching a K probe to delete gen disk and device add disk. There may be a better function out there within the kernel space that we could, within the kernel source code that we could use, but these are the ones that I found that seem to work. And it's a simple BPF program that picks up when these are called. We take information from that um, function call, push them out into the, um, basically the generator or the plugins namespace. And then we publish that within the, using the runtime as an event. So I'm going to plug this into the laptop that's actually running Cozy right now. Let me scroll down. So I just plugged it in, it takes a minute, but the kernel is eventually gonna pick it up. And you can see that the disk generator is going to publish this as an event. So now imagine you have an application or you imagine you have a controller that you're now building for your infrastructure. Maybe your SRE team now starts building operators that now use the Cozy API to mount up disks instead of using uh, a UDEV-D role. So you can actually get an event that says when it was added, which disk it is, and you can make decisions based on that. You can look it up, so on and so forth. And when I unplug it, you can see that it gets deleted. And so I think this is a really powerful concept because we can expand this to a number of things. For example, I'm just gonna unplug the, um, the power supply to this machine. And you can see that I'm getting events here. And I just plug it back in again. So, you know, again, expand this to anything that you can possibly imagine, right? And now all of a sudden we have a very, very powerful system which is fully evented at the operating system level. And we're no longer really configuring things by touching this file or, you know, manipulate, manipulating that file, uh, at least manually. These controllers can go up about and do it for us. Again, we can have specs or, or manifests which define declaratively exactly what we want instead of us trying to imperatively go onto the machine and and write the mount command ourselves. We just say what we want and these types of things make it happen. 
And for example, something like an ACPI event, imagine you push the power off button and um, maybe this is an etcd cluster. You have, let's imagine you have three nodes. I'm not saying this is something we should probably do, but I think it's an interesting um, thought experiment. Let's imagine that you hit the power off button on two of those machines and or something to that effect, and maybe it causes etcd to lose quorum. We could, in theory, watch for the ACPI events or at least the state of the power for those other machines and simply refuse to turn off when someone says uh, power button off because it would mean that we would lose etcd quorum. Again, not saying this is exactly what we should do, but I think with a system like this in the same way that we have controllers that watch for changes within the Kubernetes system and then can make decisions, we can do that, but bring it down to the operating system level, if that makes sense. And so that's the extent of my um, uh, demo, but I think there's a lot to unpack here. For example, the the generators being BPF programs. Typically, BPF isn't really used like this. I think this is kind of a unique way of using it. We could pick up and propagate events and kind of use the kernel as a database uh, instead of files. Yeah. And then any other plugin within the system can subscribe using the runtime that we talked about previously. We can subscribe for when these are published, updated, changed, deleted, whatever. We can tell uh, the runtime not to delete something if I need to do something first uh, in response to this event. There's a whole system by which basically, you know, the, the old way that we used to communicate between two programs, <laughs> I say the old way, like because he's already the thing, um, but I'm already operating in this space and then in this mindset. But, you know, you have the pipe, you know, you could cat this file and pipe it to grep. In the cozy world, you have an API where you get an input, which could be a file that is represented in a, as a spec, and um, it gets output to another machine, and that ingests it, but over a standardized API. And it's all typed instead of um, being just random strings. So I will stop sharing. Yeah, I think that was that was a really, really cool demo. And we have some awesome uh, uh, comments as well from the uh, community. So basically, like, you know, uh, controllers are controlling. Uh, you can control the operating system with the controllers. You can control the events that are happening, just like you mentioned, some of the use cases, uh, how we can, you know, uh, they, I mean, there can be tons of use cases. I think that people who are watching and will be watching later uh, might just pop up when they see the demo because it's extremely uh, flexible and extensible. So you can write plugins, you can have your controllers, you can watch uh, uh, you know, all the events and uh, do some level of things on this particular event and another particular uh, event, uh, another particular action on uh, you know, a, a specific event. Right. I think that that approach itself uh, creates a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of things that can be done with, with this uh, approach. And uh, yeah. I, I, sorry, you got me excited because you just reminded me about something that I think <laughs> kind of links it back to some of the previous things we've been talking about, and that is the kublet. There's been a lot of attempts. Um, I know of, you know, there's this idea of running self-hosted kublet, which is kind of a mess because you have to have a kublet to begin with on the host, which then bootstraps the system and it gets replaced with the self-hosted kublet that is defined within Kubernetes or running by Kubernetes. And then now you have to upgrade two different kublets and you have to do this dance. With a system like Cozy, we can have a service operator. And this could just be defined at a you know, uh, cluster level. Here's what I want the kublet to look like. Make this happen on every single one of my machines. So now the kublet version can actually follow. Imagine a controller that can look at the version of uh, the control plane that you're running. And it can actually propagate out kublet changes to your entire cluster using an API. And now you have a system that's very Kubernetes-like, but now it's actually managing Kubernetes. And it's not this self-hosted self loophole that we uh, get stuck in. Yep, absolutely. So um, is, is it mean that you care about just the kernel and you don't care about the OS? Yeah, I would. I mean, say more or less, yes. 
Uh, of course, is. there's always going to be some level of concern and, and care that you have to give an OS for security reasons. But that's kind of going back to one of the ideas with Talos is that let's actually make the OS less of a thing. And let's start treating the cluster as a big, giant machine. Really adding a node should be looked at as adding more RAM and CPU to your system. And so when you have to care less and less about the underlying nodes, you can focus on the cluster more. And so, yeah, I would say that that really is a fundamental um, uh, goal of ours. Another another question is like, um, uh, so the events generated by EVPF is something like uh, the watch API that the k has. And in, in response to these events, the engine tries to reconcile. Uh, that's more or less right. I can make that a little more um, accurate, though. The EPPF programs really are just a specialized plugin. They're just Rust code that are BPF programs that listen to event to, uh, I guess, calls within the kernel, function calls within the kernel, and they publish those to the runtime. There's a difference between the engine and the runtime. They publish this, they create an event from this and they publish it to the runtime. Now I can have another controller that actually has no BPF code. It doesn't need to do anything. Um, and it will act on that. So the output of this generator or this specialized plugin, which is an event at the end of the day, could be consumed by something else that takes that in and has another output. And in the same way that you have a pod in Kubernetes and then you have a replica controller and a replica set and then a deployment and then so on and so forth and they build on each other, from a kernel event, we can actually propagate out changes to the entire OS that we need to do. And it's just all based on a single kernel event, essentially. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, but, yeah there's a lot of concepts there, I think, that we... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I, I think I may want to break it down, you know, just to a few things. Like the first thing is the cozy spec, right? Like where we take everything in an operating system like DNS and network and expose it as an API, right? So that's irrespective of anything in the back end. It's like Kubernetes, like a, a, you know, a pod or something like that. So if you have a DNS setting, it should be the same, right? The fields that you need to manage a resolve conf will just be in the API and you could use JSON or TOML or YAML to configure it. So that's... I feel like the first layer of Cozy that we just agree on what common settings should be and then kind of separate from how we're gonna do the implementation. Um, and then obviously there's the reference implementation that Andrew is talking about where we have a lot of cool features like a plugin architecture, right? Where plugins talk over a bi-directional gRPC channel and get their configuration that somebody's applied to the cluster, kind of like the Kubernetes API server, and then they try to mutate the operating system. So that's another concept, this idea of plugins, which are you know, like a Kubernetes controller that's on system. So we've got the API is one concept. The next one is the controller, which is we call plugins. And the third one is the event architecture, right? Which is where we hook into eBPF and we watch what's happening on the system and we could propagate those events to other things. Um, and that's part of our reference implementation. So I just think those are like the three key things that you take away from Cozy is mm -hmm. those. And in API, a controller plugin architecture, so common ways of communicating, and finally, common ways of handling events, um, I think are the three core concepts that um, we're yeah, building th around. Thank you, Stephen. I know I can get, <laughs> I can do a lot of hand wavy and yeah. talk about some really abstract things, but yeah, that's absolutely right. I think that uh, that nails it. And and yeah, that's that's the uh, you know very very kind of uh, easy breakdown for understanding what the project is uh, you know bringing on the table. Uh, so you have your uh, the API and then you have the eventing engine that will publish all the events and then you have the plugins. Uh, you have the controllers that can consume those events and do certain actions based on that. So I think uh, you brought uh, all all these things at a very I mean all these concepts at uh, in a very good way. Uh, so that breakdown approach would definitely make things more easier to understand because it's a new project. I mean, things might not uh, people might not be able to uh, understand immediately, like what it does and why why it you know exists and what are the basic yeah. building blocks. So I think that that key three key things can be uh, definitely a key takeaway from this particular uh, stream that uh, you have uh, the three key concepts that uh, Stephen just mentioned. So those are actually what Cozy brings uh, to you and. Uh, 
yeah that's that's pretty exciting so uh, what what do you have i mean where where it is headed to so do we write more plugins or or what it is like we keep on writing more plugins and we keep on uh, enabling the engine with more features yeah really it's it's proving out this we're like i said we're we're pulling in a lot of these concepts into talos itself in talos 011 the entire networking stack is going to be based on cozy and we have the goal of pulling those out um into the cozy project itself and have a networking stack plugin um <laughs> i can answer that now if uh if you want are there any kind of design docs uh in the runtime there should be some documentation but as i'm sure it's abundantly clear this is still a very early project and so we all usually just get together and talk um we probably should have more um and maybe that's a way that some people can contribute is helping us document this right um yeah that's that can be one of the very good ways like people who want to engage in in something that is built uh, getting built from ground uh, something which is right. say the engine is rust oriented and uh, where you can build the plugins obviously there is there's the design docs that you can you know uh, join the conversations and build out some docs from that and see where the where it is heading to and uh, all those things can be a, a very good contribution because this is the early on stage uh, and you have seen the potential i mean you, uh, you can see the chat uh, you only say that it's it's dope so it's it's very good you you can have more granular control uh, the kubernetes controller concept coming to the operating system level so you are excited i can see that so that means and you all are in the kubernetes space i know most of the folks uh, who are there on the call actually so uh, you are in the kubernetes uh, space and you have been uh, working with kubernetes so you know uh, the power that it brings to uh, the table uh, so i think this is the right time to get involved in in such a uh, in such technology uh, where you can contribute at multiple layers in in different uh, in a programming language also rust is i think uh, getting more popular so that gives you a very good opportunity to learn rust and try to implement something uh, because there is a lot that can be done with the roadmap so yeah pretty pretty decent um, um, we have uh, covered uh, a demo we have covered getting involved the roadmap all these use cases that that brings to the table you yourself have brought a uh, lot of uh, things in mind what can be done with the events and you can you know uh, watch these events and do a, a lot of things with them so i think keep bringing those uh, we are i'm just saying on behalf of andrew and, and the cozy people who are just doing it so all the use cases are very important so if you can you know uh, just join the meetings or if you can just tweet out uh, some of the use cases that you think after watching this video uh, would be beneficial like you or you might want to use cozy in this way or you might want to write a plugin that can do this particular thing that will be really helpful so you can create issues of, of for these and start working on them or at least have them there so that you know uh, we can know like there are certain use cases which are there i'll just power the plug just a second else screen will go off okay sorry for that uh so no uh, yeah i <coughs> sorry so that's pretty much it uh, we have covered almost the we have tried i mean andrew has andrew and uh, steven has tried to cover cozy from very beginning uh, and uh, from the history to the motivation and uh, where all it can uh, you know what a scope it has so i think it is uh, you now by now you should have some idea of what cozy is the name might change as uh, steven uh, mentioned at the beginning the name might change it almost certainly will <laughs> yeah, so I, I have to, I would have to read in the stream later on and uh, you have to replace the cozy word with whatever the name we come up later on. Uh, so, but the concepts remains the same. So uh, I hope you have some amount of knowledge on the engine, uh, the runtime, the plugins that are there and the specification that uh, the team is trying, the community basically is trying to build around the operating system level and uh, hope you will join uh, join forces and uh, drive this project collectively. I know Andrew is very motivated to, uh, even if it doesn't pick off to the extent that he has thought, uh, he would definitely use it in Talos, uh, which yep. already he has put some of, uh, you know, some of the Talos folks are already working on creating the plugins and getting used it. So this project will definitely be used in, in Talos, uh, but uh, it has a bigger vision so that, you know, a, a bigger picture is still there that uh, we all can see. 
so let us know what what are your use cases what you think uh, that uh, it will you know uh, you can build with it or the plugins and all the, all those uh, things uh, anything else you would like to add steven and andrew um no i um thank you for having me again and uh it's always fun as usual i look forward to when we rename the project and we can do this all over again and uh we could pretend like this never happened and uh we'll have a much more comprehensive demo <laughs> it was really fun thank you for having me and maybe we could talk about cross plane sometime that's another cool project so yeah yeah sure let's let's i'll, I'll connect with you uh, for the cross plane and let's see where what we can do and yes andrew mentioned it right we'll have more design docs we'll have more documentation we'll have more structured project uh, a renamed one and we'll go all over again with, in, a, in a nice and cooler way uh, <laughs> than this one but still it was fun and uh, i think i really got um, um, not not only the glimpse but i really got some of the key components that are there with cozy projects and some of the key areas that i can contribute to or i can learn more from or at least i can watch keep an eye on and uh, just see what where this is uh, heading towards so i think that will be pretty interesting let's see if we have something uh, for the questions yeah design doc one we have done the name is fine yeah there is there is some uh, discussion with the name uh, so if you join one of the meetings you'll you'll get to know what what is with the it, name because it's a political a reason I, I mean really there's already a cozy it's the what is it container object storage interface um yeah. so, so it's the, unfortunately for already cozy, used yeah, if, yeah. if you search for cozy kubernetes you will find uh, another acronym for that so right. uh, yeah. it's okay i mean we can rename that we are in the early stages so it's it's completely right. fine uh, but the project overall uh, goal should be clear and the goal will remain the same uh, yeah. obviously the modifications will be there the the structure might change and things will keep on changing and evolving in in a betterment of the features that uh, people or the community would want uh, especially more oriented towards uh, uh, because Andrew is driving it, so he will be definitely using it for Talos. So more from the Talos uh, folks will also be here. So you can see like Talos is already another awesome project. We did a stream. I posted a link in the YouTube. So those stuff and uh, those knowledge is also getting uh, you know populated over here. So that's that's even make it more exciting because there's already a tons of uh, ton of learning that uh, that is there with Talos. So I think it it will be great. Yes. So thank you all for joining in today and, um, uh, you know, making the show awesome because without the community, I mean, uh, when you learn, I learn and uh, the, the uh, people who are there, the maintainers, they also enjoy a lot when you keep on asking questions. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for your time. I'll, I'll definitely, I don't know how many streams I'll do with you, but I'll do a lot. Uh, I'll make <laughs> sure you write, you write Linux from scratch uh, live. So yeah. <laughs> So we'll do a lot, of, lot more streams uh, with uh, with Andrew, Stephen on Crossplane. So we'll we'll keep doing those and we'll keep learning. Uh, so let the learning be continue. But the only thing that they want is the contributions. So we should uh, at least use it, contribute it, see the use cases and all those stuff. So thank you, Stephen and Andrew, for coming on the stream and thank you all for joining in today. And uh, we'll see you next time. There are, I think there is a stream on 10th as well. On And uh, I mean, there are tons of streams. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. Even I am losing track of the streams that I'm having. So it's just a calendar invite that pops up. And I, I do all this setup immediately. <laughs> and, and I try to do that. So yeah, make sure you subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon so that you do not miss. Because this will be a super learning June uh, and July as well. But June is full packed with a lot of streams. So thank you all for your time and we'll see you next time. Bye. Right. Thank you.